Yeah, I was uh, doing a bunch of radio this morning, and you know, they're asking me what are the biggest stories in camp. And really, um, you know, we we had a meeting last night, and we talked about it. You know, there's really two main stories. It's who's going to be the fifth starter, assuming health with the other four, and the last two spots on the bench. You know, and that's really it. I mean, everything else is kind of accounted for, which is you know a result of having a a, st a solid, steady, good team with not a lot of competition. So you'd much rather be in that position. I've said it many times going into an off season. I'd rather have only need to get one player or two players rather than to go get five or six or a trade deadline. So I think it's a reflection of you know having a good club and guys that are under club control and, and signed. On paper, it, you could point to your bench and say it, it doesn't look outstanding. Do you look at it that way or do you look to add during spring or do you think you've got the pieces if you need to? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you're not going to be perfect. I think what's challenging for us, and we had this um, – at the trade deadline last year, I remember talking to some of our players about this. When we were looking to add to the bench, you know, there were a bunch of really good players that were out there. And for a bench role, because of the way, you know, Snit runs things, which I'm totally on board with, you know, our guys play every day. So it's hard to have bench players that are going to be good clubhouse guys and accept their role that, you know, Austin Riley's going to play every day, Matt Olson's going to play every day, and so on. And the outfielders the same way, so the at-bats aren't going to be there. So you need a certain type of person, a certain type of individual. So. Nicky Lopez, for example, you know, there were guys uh, out there that were more accomplished um, and so on, but they wouldn't have fit in our minds with how we, you know, I don't know how happy they would have been in that role. Lopez, with the work we did on him, was a, a perfect fit for us. And that's the, the challenging part. So, um, you know, the guys that are competing, they're going to fit. You know, what we have to prepare for is if someone's out for a long period of time, what's it look like down in Gwinnett? You know, how does that look? What's the next? And we're always looking at, you know, who's the everyday first baseman going to be or third baseman or outfielder if somebody gets hurt. So um, look behind the plate with Travis. We've got the guy who's outstanding. Um, and Guillaume is set on the team as well. And we think he can cover all the infield spots and a left-handed bat, great teammate, contact, good defender. So um, those last two spots, you know, it's going to come down to how Snit's going to use these guys. But um, I would tell you that, I think um, you know speed is likely going to factor for one of those two. Just it would make sense to have for Snit to have that option, but um, we'll make that decision at the end of camp. Well, it's been it's been documented about Chris Sales and his past injuries, all that kind of stuff. What made him a good fit for this team in this organization? Yeah, I mean, look, the injuries um, we feel like they've been more freak injuries the last few years. Look, he had the Tommy John a few years ago. That's obviously a real arm injury and a serious one, but he recovered from that. And then the other ones for the most part have been, you know, getting a comeback or off the hand, falling off a bike and hurting his wrist. Um, and look, there's obviously risk. Look, at some point, you know, you, you're getting hurt. There's something to it. But uh, prior to that, he was a durable guy would post, um, you know, look, we think the ability is phenomenal. Uh, and then the person and what he brings and, um, you know, how he can impact his, his teammates just by being himself. And you know, everybody we talked to that had either been a coach around him or uh, been a teammate just had such incredible things to say. And you almost get more excited about acquiring him the more you hear about him and the more work we did on him. How happy are you with that bullpen that you built? You know, that's kind of, was that kind of what you envisioned when you started, uh, you know, the, grew up the, the plans and all that? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. Um, I think Snit having a deep bullpen is is really important uh, because, look, we expect to be a competitive team and we expect to be in a lot of games. So, you know, that means we're going to be down, but we want to keep the games close. And, you know, um, if we as a front office don't give Snit enough options, um, that puts him in a, in a really tough spot. And, um, you know, we're also keeping guys healthy as well. We can go in and give guys days off and not have to overwork guys and so on. So bullpen depth is definitely a priority and look there's likely going to be injuries as well so knowing that if somebody a late inning guy like Iglesias started the year on the IL last year if you have that depth you're still protected for late in the game and and then candidly beyond that uh, having lived through 2019 trade deadline and having to trade for relievers I said it after the fact I don't ever want to have to do that again it's a miserable position to be in can you kind of enjoy go to the beach? I mean, you don't have as yeah. much going on. Or you still um, always. You know what? You start so you know you, you start spring training. You know that every club is going to have some type of injury. It's going to happen, all thirty, right? So it's like you go in in the spring. It's not to be glass half empty, but um, stuff's going to come up, right? Someone's going to be sore. You know, something's going to happen, and you just hope that you have the depth to maintain it. So um, I've just learned over time. I think you know you just built to worry in these jobs. You know, the minute you think you got it solved or it's easy, you get bit, 
Um, but look, we think we have a really good team. I, you know, we see all the projections and things like, like that. And um, yeah, we think we have a really good team, but we also know there's a ton of really good teams in the NL and we have to get to the playoffs first, right? So that's gonna be the goal, that, that won't change. Uh, but you know, we do like the group that we have. Going couple back to guys Chris Hill for a second, it, you said that your excitement has kind of built more after you've acquired him. What have you learned about him that makes you more excited at this point? I mean, we had been talking about getting him for the last year. I mean, we had conversations with Boston on and off for a while, um, even throughout last summer. And um, just, you know, seeing, you know, I'm Braves Fest, you know, I'm watching the clips of our guys and seeing how excited, you know, Strider is and Max Fried and, you know, you know, those guys are such, you know, they, they have, they carry a high bar for them to get, you know, for, for you to have their, their respect and so on. And the fact that they're that excited about him and, you know, everything you hear about Chris Sale and everybody you talk to um, has unbelievable things to say. And I just think, you know, beyond what he's going to do on the mound, just the example that he sets the same way Charlie Morton does the same thing. So we have a lot of depth on the mound. A lot of our young talent is all on the mound. And knowing we have two pillars in terms of really good veterans in Morton and Sale is, is really exciting. All the guys have said Wolf Series are bust. How satisfied are you with, I guess, just the motivation guys have come up with? Yeah, I mean, that's basically how I view it. Um, whatever these guys want to use as fuel, right? Like, I was telling someone this today. Um, you know, there was a Phil Jackson quote I came out. I, I sent it to Snit. was basically that speeches don't motivate players. Motivated players make great teams. And... That just tells me these guys are really driven, they're really motivated, um, and I, you know, it made me think about our roster. You know, we have a lot of really motivated guys, and it's you know, coming from a guy like Phil Jackson, who's won that much. It, it landed with me, and I really started thinking about our team and our roster. So when I see comments like that, however these guys want to view it, um, whatever they use as fuel is is great. I mean, I'm much more just in the moment today. Um, you know, we have to get through spring healthy. We've got to try to win the division, all, all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, the one year I looked ahead was after the you know, 2020 Game 7 loss in the CS. I started thinking playoffs and what it would take to win in the postseason, and um, it cost us. I, did ba- I, think I, I thought I did a bad job in the offseason and uh, basically scrambled in 21, and obviously we were able to pull it off, but um, you know, it's something that I, I learned from, you know, that I'm, just, I'm never going to get ahead of my, myself. And, but look, players aren't front office guys, and they have to worry about competing, and if that works, outstanding. Alex, what do you think? Come in and see Charlie and Aaron, and what went into the decision to bring him back, or was it even a was it just a no brainer for you? Yeah, I mean, we knew we wanted him back. Uh, I think, like anything else, you're um, you're always when you're going out, you're trying to balance out payroll needs you have. And look, we non tendered a lot of players. Um, we have to make changes, and just like anything else, you have a good team. The way that the way this is set up is, if you keep your team together, it's going to get more expensive each year. So, um, and you want guys to perform and be healthy and, and to get more expensive. So, you're going to have to make tough choices, tough decisions, and you're trying to, you know, we say there's only so much of the pie to go around. So, you're just trying to make sure that financially it can work to have a good team. So, having Charlie Morton on this team was there was no doubt about it. I mean, that we expressed that early. I think it was just trying to make sure and walk through what we felt our needs were going to be, um, how we were going to allocate our our dollars. Um, but I was confident that we'd find a way and that he would be back. I know you said no news, but did everybody report? Is anybody behind this lingering? Yeah, everyone everyone re- reported um, nothing right now. But, you know, like a lot of times there's stuff that goes on in camp and we don't announce it. And just as guys make it to opening day, it's great. So, um, and if we think guys are going to go on the aisle, that's when we'll come out and announce to the media. But, look, there's going to be things that occur. You know, a guy might be sore in a bullpen one day or might have a tight hammy or tight back and they get delayed and you know maybe they would have played and that's not something we'll come out and announce but uh right now we don't have any any surprises um, um in terms of ILs or things like that and then, in all the years you've uh, worked closely with uh Snit, what have you admired the most about him um i love the fact that he's the same person uh from the day i walked in the door you know he, i came in didn't know him never met him he had a year on his deal uh he's genuine authentic uh, there's not a political bone in his body, and I'm, I'm all about that, uh, that just someone like that. And um, he's a great partner, you know, and I really view it that way. Um, you know, it, it worked out so well for me because I walk in and I get a guy like that that I get to, to work with. So, um, and I think the players see it, the fans see it, obviously the media does it as well. Um, and I watch a lot of other sports and a lot of other coaches and, and so on, and 
he's as good as it gets. There's always been some surprises in camp. Who are some young guys that you're looking forward to kind of seeing develop this spring? Uh, I mean, obviously our young prospects. I'm curious how guys like, you know, our young starters are the ones that are the guys that are most hyped up. So I'm curious I, how AJ smith Sharver looks, how Hurston Waldrop looks. Um, but again, those guys are so young and, you know, not a ton of experience. You know, uh, the kid we got from San Diego, he's not that young, but he's still young in his career. Ray Kerr, just to see his stuff as well. Um, and, you know, we always get to see the prospects on, on the backfields as well. But I'd say the young arms more than anything else, especially because we've got that battle for the fifth spot. Um, it'll just be fun to see some of those guys. But the fourth outfielder type stuff. What do you like about that? You got Martinez, Ruppo, White. Wall, yeah, I think, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit last night. I think some of the decisions are going to be knowing that, and again, Snit will make this decision, but I know, like, there's been talk about, you know, does Jared Kelnick, do we just give him every day at bats to start? I mean, we were able to live through Mike Harris having a rough start to the year, and we lived through it, and he was phenomenal through the end of the year. So the fact that we have depth in the lineup, you know, he's 24 years old, um, and getting every day at bats could have real value for him. And, uh, you know, to platoon him at this time, you know, again, I don't want to speak for Snip, but we've talked about it, that I don't, I don't think the lean is to do that. And I think the lean is to, especially because we have a good offensive club, is to give him every day at bats. And that's going to impact who the fourth outfielder is. So you take a J.P. Martinez, for example, we might decide we want to see him get at bats in Gwinnett. Or we might decide if there's a, a meaningful role that we do want to carry him. So that's, it's not just necessarily going to be who are the best players. It's who are the best fit? Who's the best fit? It's the same way that Grissom and Shoemake weren't going to be up here to sit on the bench last year. They needed to play. So, you know, those last two spots, knowing that we're likely not going to have playing time, I think they're going to be really specific to find roles, and that's where I'm, I think speed will be certainly one of the, the two, I, I would think. Um, and, look, if there's somebody going on the IL and we think there's at-bats, then that ch that'll certainly change things. Will you have any conversations with Max just to say they were on the same page type of thing? Um, yeah, I'd say this. I wouldn't announce it if we, we did. Um, I definitely i am confident that our guys know, you know um, where they stand, where they sit with us. Max certainly does. Um, I saw his answers at Braves Fest. I thought they were great. And that wasn't like me sitting down with him and saying, hey, let, let's agree that we're going to say this. Like That was just Max being Max, being honest, you know. And um, I love the fact that he said, hey, I understand how the organization likes to do things. They're private. I never sat him down and told him that. He just knows. He's been around. Um, you know, but look, it goes without saying, he's great. Anytime you have a great player in, in a free agent year, it's going to be a topic. Um, and again, our goal is always going to be to keep these guys while also making sure that we're keeping a competitive club around them. And that's the trick to it, I'm trying to balance it out. So, um, but any conversations and things like that that we have, we, we work so hard to keep it quiet. And um, that's really, I don't have anything more to say other than that. How much went into the decision when just bringing back Charlie now kind of in this new role? You know, expect for him realistically. yeah, I mean, Charlie had a great year and, you know, I know he hit the IL right at the end, but he's been able to post for us in all three years and um, you know, he had an ERA in the mid threes um, and there was some things that, you know, he's still, I think they're easy things he can continue to get better at, but his stuff is still very good. He's a pillar. He continues to take the ball and you look at it, Elder, um, Charlie and Strider carried us for a good chunk of the year uh, when Max and Kyle Wright were out. So, um, you know, his stuff hasn't declined, hasn't changed. His curveball's still elite. The fastball's still elite. And um, we think he's poised to have another great year again. So um, I know everyone talks about his age and so on, but he's a great athlete. The work ethic's phenomenal. He's great in the clubhouse, and stuff is still really good. Can you talk about motivated players, motivate players? From your perspective, when you're listening to these things at FanFest and everything, how much will motivation really play a factor for these guys in taking the next step? I mean, they've always been motivated, right? We've been a good team all six years I've been here, and we've had a lot of changes to that room. Sure, there's a certain core, um, but we've withstood a lot of you know tough losses, right? Really good players, great teammates, great clubhouse guys, and um, that's credit to Snit, credit to the coaches, and obviously the guys in the room. But um, I'm not surprised just because, yeah, of course you need ability, and these guys are all really talented. But you know, I think we we really do emphasize character, work ethic, makeup. So. Uh, by design, we expect to have those type of guys. And, you know, there's times that we walk away from really talented players, and it's a challenge. But, um, you know, we, we target guys like that that are driven, motivated. Um, you know, I know there was a talk I mean, when we were signing all these guys to extensions, you know, are they going to get complacent now that they don't, they're not playing for anything and they're set for life and so on. And 
you know, if you're betting on the right person, that stuff shouldn't matter. It's just you're getting it out of the way. So these guys are all about winning, and that's it's great to have. You talked about how you keep you're kind of famous for keeping things so quiet. How do you build that? Or do you have to like bet the people around? Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, um, <laughs> the only person that knows everything is T Terry Murdoch. Literally, I mean, and I'll tell Snit at times, but I love the fact Snit has never blown me up, and you know, he's just kind of like, hey, you tell me when you need to tell me, and. I remember I called him uh, on, on Donaldson. Um, he was flying into Atlanta, and I told him, and he's great. He's just like, hey, go do your thing. I'm here if you need me. Um, and we have a really small front office group. I just don't want to get into the early as a GM. I told everybody, and then stuff would leak, and then you start thinking, who could it be? And you start looking at people differently, and, and it's not fair, you know? So um, if I know that myself and Terry are basically the only ones that know, and it's not leaking, um, and then maybe select few, of um, our, our staff in the, in the front office. Um, just and Look, and the only reason we do it, it's just easier to work that way, right? Less distractions, less noise. Um, and I know it can be irritating for media and fans and so on, but um, you know that I believe that's the best way to do this job. And if we could just open it up and tell everybody everything and that would work, we would do it. But it's just, I feel like that's, that's the best way for us to get the job done. Or did you keep your son quiet in this scenario? I just don't tell him a whole lot either, um, but he's he's getting better. He's getting better, and um, you know he um, he knew about the Chris Sale deal. And you know this is I give him credit on this one. It was over um, over the holidays, and he was at his uncle's house, and uh, his cousins were there, and so on. And uh, they asked him. They said, "Ah, hey, you know, do you, the Braves have anything going on, or your dad have anything going on?" He's like, "Nope, nope, yeah. nope." So and then yeah, and he had done a, a sleepover, and when I got him. I got him at the house. They stayed over at their house, and he came into the car, and he goes, hey, so where are we on sale? How's it going, you know? And I said, hey, we're getting close. I think we're going to get it done. And uh, he goes, okay. I said, hey, I said, you didn't say anything, right? He's like, nope. I kept my mouth shut. I was quiet. So he's learned. He's done a great job. Um, and I, you know, I tell him he's got to be really careful at, at school as, as well. But um, no, I think it's just once it's done, yeah, sure, we'll talk about it and so on. But, um, you know, I had a GM tell me um, after the trade was done, he said, man, I didn't even, you know, we didn't even think about sale or consider sale. And you know, look, we'll see how he does and so on. But, you know, sometimes, especially with trades, you don't realize someone's available and or you never thought of the name. And when I see rumors, I might take a second look of another player. It makes me look a second time that I missed something. So, um, you know, we're just we think that that works best for us. Of course, Ryder mentioned changing the rhetoric going off of last year and preparing for postseason, all this, that, the other thing. Did you guys as an organization look back during the offseason and think something needed to change in that realm to be better prepared, or was that? Yeah, I mean, look, we're always looking all the time, right? Unless you win the World Series, you're reviewing everything, scouting, development, advance, training. You know, that's every organization in sports is doing that at all times, right? So you want answers, right? You're not – I've never subscribed to that. Oh, it's just baseball. You know, it happens, or I just – you got to take something out of it, right? So you know, the, the tough part is only one of 30 are going to win the World Series. So, you know, you get to camp and everyone's saying World Series, World Series. Of all 30 teams, and it's, you know, only one of them is going to end up getting there. So um, we're, that's the beauty of this, right? You just, you're never going to solve it. No one's won World Series every year, and um, you have to continue to evolve. How much discussion was there just because there was that gap when you guys do win a division of kind of making sure you're still in attack mode when you get into the playoffs because it feels like there's been a lull and that's just something that's been talked about. I mean, how much did you think about it yourself? Yeah, I mean, I know that was there was a lot of talk about the layoff and this and that. I just felt like, you know, anything that looks like excuses, this is just speaking for myself. I just, I don't subscribe to it. I don't want to give it any oxygen. I also think it's disrespectful to the Phillies. You know, like if we had won and we didn't have a layoff and someone said, well, you know, we if we didn't have the layoff, like, no, like we played better. We won, you know, so... If someone wants to discredit when we won the World Series and say, well, this or that, like, no, you, you know, at the end of the day, we both played and we didn't get it done. You know, and the re bottom line is you have to get it done. No excuses. Find a way. And that that's everybody. Right. That starts with me and all the above. So um, I know this. If you told us, hey, be the wild card, play an extra round or get the, the buy, we're taking the buy. So um, and I think everyone would tell you the same thing. So. I understand people say, wow, they won 104 games. They were so good. How did that happen? Well, because the Phillies are really good as well, you know. So it's a combination of both. You know, could we have done things better? Absolutely. But I also think they deserve a ton of credit because they're a phenomenal team. Does it give you any reassurance when you look up on day one and you got Riley and you got all these guys here early when it could be just pitches and catches, but it shows you, hey, we got the right character guys in here that want 
Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? When you sign guys to long-term deals, like you think about Austin Riley, biggest contract in the history of the Braves, 10 years, 200 plus million. I mean, you know, if he decides to not be a high character guy and not do, what, what are we going to do, right? We're basically stuck. So um, that's why you put a lot of weight into those decisions when you're giving out those contracts. And you know, you know who Austin Riley is as a person, how he was raised, the way he goes about it. Um, I don't have any any doubt about it, you know? Like, I told the story, I think, when we signed him. Like, you watch little things, like, um, there's some unbelievable spread of food or something, and, like, he's going for the, for, the, for the salad bar, you know? And it's like, he could easily just not make the right decision, you know? No one's telling him that, but uh, he constantly wants to get better. And, um, you know, I'm not surprised. It's kind of what I expect from these guys. I'm just, I'm proud of the, the group. I'm proud of the, the character. Um, I think they, they, they handle themselves the way we want them to handle themselves, whether it's media, fans, organizations, staff, support staff. Um, you know, I think it's obviously you want to win, but I think these, you know, they represent the South, the city, the community, and these guys are awesome. Do you expect another historic season from Ronald Acuna this year? I mean, you know, people say, like, I... Like, I'm not surprised, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, he's that good, you know? And look, health and all those things, but um, nothing I'm like, wow, that came out of nowhere. That was a surprise. Like, he was very capable of that. And even before he got hurt in 21, he was, you know, the stolen base totals weren't necessarily as high, but still high. Um, he's that good. And, you know, the most incredible part is how he just cut the, the strikeout rate down. So um, he keeps getting better. He's in phenomenal shape, takes great care of himself. Um, I just, assuming health, I expect him to be an elite player. The uh, eight starts that you gave Kirsten Waldrop, unlike a lot of the college pitchers that get drafted, do you think that gives him a leg up as far as getting him in here and maybe getting up here sooner if he shows that he's ready? Yeah, you know what, it was about just, you know, part of that, the move up was just the seasons were ending for all the different affiliates, right? So Mississippi was done and Gwinnett still had another week, right? So it was just like continuing to give him exposure and give him reps and so on. And, um, you know, it just all those experiences I believe should help him should have helped him going into the off season and look well you know this is his first spring training we'll see how that goes and um, but we're excited to have him obviously the talent's great um, we were elated to get him where we did in the draft our amateur department did a great job with him and um, but again he's young in his career but as you guys have seen if we think someone can help us you know we'll certainly uh, make the move